G'day, my name is Adam Draycott, and you are watching the online ministry from St. Augustine's Anglican Church here in Inverell. Uh, welcome. Uh, this ministry has been prepared for the 11th of September 2022, uh, the 24th Ordinary Sunday in our calendar. And our sentence of scripture comes from Psalm 36, verse 7. How precious, O oh God, is your constant love. We find protection under the shadow of your wings. We're going to enjoy a time of praise that reflects on God's constant love. Our collect prayer for today. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace that we might be cleansed from all our sins and serve you 
with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We come to the ministry of God's Word. Our Bible readings come from Numbers 11, verses 18 to 30, Psalm 46, and Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, and then flick over to Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Remember, we are undertaking a preaching series through the book of Acts, and so I commend the readings from Acts to you. Read them out loud, uh, whomever you're with. If you're in church, most especially, I commend the public reading of the scriptures to you. As a property valuer, there were many doorbell experiences that I had. Uh, green sleeves, if you know that tune, never seemed to stop. It was painful. Uh, when the saints would get a run, too bad they didn't make the eight. Jingle bells would get a, a run any time of the year. Uh, and the most popular doorbell tune of all, ding dong. That's right, I know, it's amazing. Of course, if I visited a farm, it was the chorus of the working dogs barking that declared your arrival. I don't think I've seen a doorbell on a farmhouse. Now, in our passage, do you see the big doorbell ringing? Do you see God turn up? And if you do, well, like verse 12, we should be amazed, maybe perplexed, and we should also ask, what does it all mean? So let's ask God. Father God, help us to understand what this all means. Help us to use this time well. Be at work by your spirit, we ask in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's talk about the when. Verse 1, it's when the day of Pentecost came. Pentecost is a Jewish festival that happened 50 days after Passover. 50 days after that first Passover in Egypt, God's rescue, what happened? Well, uh, that was the giving of the Law to Moses and Sinai. And that is what Pentecost would come to commemorate. Passover, Pentecost were remembered year after year. And here is another Pentecost. Again, this is... This one is 50 days after Passover, like it was back in, uh, after Egypt. But this Passover is different. This is the Passover, as the Passover lamb is sacrificed. That sacrifice to end all sacrifices, uh, the cross of Jesus Christ. God's ultimate rescue as his judgment passes over, as wrath is turned aside, and forgiveness is assured, as that ancient Passover is fulfilled in the cross. And as we come to Pentecost, here is this moment where God now, he, he, he comes, and he now writes his law on our hearts by his Holy Spirit. Do we see that? It's amazing. And so like all good Anglicans, we pray, Lord, write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. He summarizes the law. Love God, love your neighbor, and we pray, Lord, write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful thing to be an Anglican, isn't it? <laughs> now, who? Who is the who here? Notice they're all together in one place. Who are the they? I take the they to be those mentioned in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. We looked at this last week. Here are the believers in Jerusalem. It's a group, verse 15, that we're told numbers 120, and it is this same group that Peter addresses uh, in order to replace Judas. And I've, I think it's the same group on view here in chapter 2. Where is this happening? Well, it's in Jerusalem, just like Jesus told them. And what about the how? <laughs> the how is very interesting. Think, Old Testament again. How did God turn up to Moses? Fire, burning bush, Exodus chapter 3. And what about after Pharaoh and the plagues? Was 
God leads his people out from Egypt to Sinai to the promised land. How does he lead them? With a pillar of fire. And then Solomon, he builds his temple. He says a prayer. And then 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. What comes down from heaven? Fire. If you're a pyromaniac, you're going to love this. Fire comes down from heaven and the glory of the Lord fills the temple. And so little wonder, Hebrews 13 says, our God is a consuming fire. That is right. Call it out. Don't be shy. Now, what about here? Mm, you know the answer already, but come with me to Luke 3.16. John the Baptist says, what did John the Baptist say in Luke 3.16? I baptize you with water. One more powerful than I will come. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with, you got it, fire. And then we come to Acts chapter 1 verse 5. Uh, Jesus said, John baptized with water. In a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the reader might ask, but what? Fire! And with fire, maybe. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Let's see the fire. Uh, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Do you see God turn up? You've got to see that. Do you see that what Jesus told them to wait for, and what John the Baptist said Christ would do, it happens here. Licks of fire show God has turned up in a vivid, dynamic way. They are baptized personally by the Holy Spirit and with fire. Men and women receive the Holy Spirit, apostles, ordinary believers, sons and daughters and mothers and brothers. And here the Jerusalem church is born. Here comes the new age of the church. And can I say, man... This is some doorbell, isn't it? Some entry, some announcement. Here is the birth of the church. Complete with candles. <laughs> now, we have to ask why. We've done the when and the where and the who. How about the why? Look at verse 4. Notice they're all speaking in tongues. Let me be clear on this. Literally, they're speaking native languages. The Greek word is glossa. That's what it means. What is, in, what is not on view is the Greek word glo glossolalia. <laughs> it's a different word. It's related, but it's a different word. That's not on view. And of course, you know, I'm going to say uh, glossolalia is a kind of tongue speaking that we associate with some Christian gatherings, which is unformed and unintelligible. That is not on view. This is different dialects, languages that are comprehensible. Now, do you remember the story about the Tower of Babel? If you're a Sunday school graduate, you might. Genesis 11, you could read it there. Do you remember the story? The whole world had one language. They aspired to make a name for themselves, built a city and kept building it up to reach God. God's not okay with that. And so they're scattered and their language is confused. And isn't this... What we find in Acts 2, I want to say to you, isn't it the complete opposite? Do we see Babel undone, Babel in reverse? Do you see man doesn't go up? Do you see God comes down? Do you see people aren't scattered? No, they're gathered and drawn into this momentous event. And the languages, people from other nations understand each other. It's clear and it's comprehensible. Look at verse 8. 
uh, verse 7, aren't these guys speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? This is really important. Jews from all over are here in Jerusalem for Pentecost, as they always did. All those locations mentioned in verses 9 to 10 represent all the points of the compass, north, south, east and west. They're all brought together. And as they hear the native language, end of verse 11, what do they hear at the end of verse 11? What does it say? Do you see it? You can't miss it. They say, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. They hear them declaring the wonders of God. Years ago, the Draycott family were in Hanoi, Vietnam, and we're walking along, and we always learn um, how to say hello in the original, in, in the local language, the original local language. And if someone made eye contact, um, quite often I, I would smile. And, and in Hanoi, uh, the greeting is Xin Chao, and I did this, and the, the usually get a smile, and it's I just really enjoy engaging with the locals. Um, my kids didn't enjoy it. They just like, Dad, you're just so embarrassing. So mission accomplished again. Uh, I do remember one local gentleman in Hanoi, and I said, he's, he's caught my eye, and he's looking. I mean, we stand out as Aussies. And I, I smile. Sin chow. And I think I'm very clever, of course. And the reply is, G'day, mate. G'day, mate. Just like that. Complete with the accent. He nailed it. It was a, a regular language for him. We were amazed. We were perplexed. We knew what he was saying. It just came off naturally. And uh, there you go. It was memorable for me. This is not just a miracle of hearing one's native language. Okay? Like the Holy Spirit is some kind of United Nations translator in our ear. No, this is the miracle also of speaking. Do we see the Holy Spirit enable uh, the early church to speak a language previously unlearned to these 15 or so different language groups from all directions declare the wonder of, wonders of God? See, there's another reversal of Babel, isn't there? You know, in Babel, it was humanity that wanted to make a name for themselves. And you see here, this is God. Uh, he is making a name for himself. They are declaring the wonders, not of humanity, of God. It's a reversal. And so then I want to say to you, do you see the why? As they declare the wonders of God, this is about bearing witness. The early church. And this is consistent with what Jesus said the Spirit would do. The Spirit, John 14, 26, Jesus said he will teach you all things, remind you of everything I've said. John 15, 16, Jesus said he will testify about me. Do we see that that is what the Holy Spirit does? He points people to Jesus. He testifies about his words. He reminds us of the words of Jesus and he testifies about the Son of God. Come to redeem the world. This is really important. Do we see God demonstrating to all and sundry that as he sends his mob to Jerusalem and then beyond Jerusalem to Judea, beyond Judea to Samaria, beyond Samaria to the ends of the earth, chapter 1, verse 8, as God pushes out, he pushes his people out. There is going to be no obstacle. Not even language will prove an obstruction to the advance of the gospel for the early church. This is how we explain the explosion. One of the reasons. I mean, do we see God value the native tongue? Someone said the greatest missionary is the Bible in the mother tongue. This is, this is so true. It never needs a furlough and it is never considered a foreigner. See, the gospel is for all and see that God has done it. Nothing will inhibit his people declaring the wonders of God. And if that is true, if that is what is on view here, the witness of God's people, well, what inhibits you? 
What inhibits you from declaring the wonders of God? God has turned up in your life, hasn't he? Here is the birth of the church. Again, complete with candles. Happy birthday. See God's church become a spirit-empowered witness to the nations. This is who we are. His spirit-filled people are God's announcement that, that God is here. He is present. He is living. He is real. He is dynamic. He is active. And as we know that truth, as we think that truth through very carefully, do we recognise that as a church, that we this is what we're to do in here in Inverell or wherever you are. We are people that declare the wonders of God. That through faith in his Son, by his Spirit, God has come to us in a deep and personal way that we are his witnesses. And so the encouragement is, go out and witness. Declare the wonders of God uh, to us in Christ Jesus and do it by his Spirit. Here is the last thing. This is also about God's love. As the holy God dares take up residence in our hearts. I know what I'm like and you know what you are like. And uh, the God will dwell in our hearts is so humbling. But it's all of his love. Romans 5 verse 5 says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is God's love on view here. God has entered in. Christ dwells within us by the person of his Holy Spirit. This is an incredible, significant moment of grace. And now again, because it's true, we then go and declare the wonders of God and the love of God. Such is the power of the gospel, we bear witness to him. So again, brothers and sisters, let's go do it. Let's go do it. Now that's the sermon. And no doubt you've got questions. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a time of praise. And we'll come back and I'm going to chew off some questions.
right, so you've heard the preaching of God's word and I could preach that sermon and walk away. I know there are questions that hang. And, uh, and so here's a few. I've anticipated some. Uh, so here's one. Hey, Adam, is this normative and typical of how we receive the Holy Spirit? It, that's a fair question. And my answer is, if tongues of fire are the norm, why isn't that presented consistently as the norm in the rest of the book of Acts? Because it's not. You don't ever see it again in Acts. And I think this is because there's a significant moment in salvation history, uh, a public demonstration of God's outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what we see here. But we will see believers replicate the ability to speak other languages and witness as we work through Acts. Um, but we need to be mindful of standing in the, in the shoes of the early church too quickly and doing a like for like, because that'll get you into a bit of bother, I think. That's what I think. Uh, so the answer is no, it's not normative. Uh, question. Here's another question. Just think real hard about this one. The, Jer the Jerusalem church believe, and then they have to wait for the Spirit. Right? Yeah. And then in chapter 8, that other reading I had, uh, the Samaritans believe they have to wait too. That's curious. And then we might say, is that the same for us? Do we believe first and then we have to wait for an extra experience? We wait to meet the person of the Spirit. Uh, let me answer that. It's a big question. Uh, the Jews and the Samaritans experienced long-standing historical division. So there's a backstory. Do we see God heals that division? He treats them a similar way. Uh, they both believe and then later on uh, uh, the Spirit comes. And so I think God does treat them the same um, in order to build that bridge between Jew and Samaritan. He's bringing them together. And that's why you see Peter and John turn up. And so they can vouch as witnesses. That's why there's two, not just Philip. Now, I also think, now you're going to have to work a bit harder now. I also think that God treats them the same because uh, they parallel Israel's experience. You go, oh, what, what, what? Let me explain. How do the Ten Commandments start? Ten Commandments, it's, don't get this from your prayer book, Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from Egypt. I saved you. Ten Commandments start with grace. God's rescue is the context of those commands. They're rescued, they belong, and then 50 days later, the law comes, complete with fire, remember. And that's the pattern. And I think uh, Jerusalem and the Samaritans, who are, they're all, he, they all come from this. Uh, they echo that experience. Now, as you think that through of belonging and then it's delayed and uh, that either the law comes or the spirit comes, uh, let me now ask you a question as you hold that in your imagination. What if after Sinai, after all of God's big acts, a foreigner comes into the camp and embraces Israel's God in every way. And they say, I'm in. At what stage would the law apply to them? The laws came on Sinai. At what stage? They, I, I believe I belong. Do they have to wait for a revealing of the law? Is there a cooling off period? Is there an extra experience to wait for? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'll wait for circumcision, thanks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or does their love for God and their love for neighbor, does it apply straight away? And how can, how can the answer not be yes to that? Does their love for God and their love for neighbor, a summary of the law, does it not, does it not apply straight away? And of course it does. And so do we see how, how important it is to think about where we stand in salvation history? I'm not a Hebrew. I don't stand in such close proximity to these big events, including this one at Pentecost uh, following Jesus' death on the cross. 
All right. So then you say, well, what is normative? And I think we get, it's, the scriptures make it easy for us. See, again, I'm not um, part of the early Jerusalem church. I'm not a Samaritan. I'm not a Hebrew from the time of the Exodus or a foreigner for that matter. So what is normative? Look at verse 38 of chapter 2. Peter has just preached and he says to the crowds, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 41, 3,000 people came to believe. Notice there's no external tongues of fire mentioned. There's no external supernatural phenomena mentioned. There is no delay mentioned. There's no waiting for an extra later experience that's mentioned ever. Secondly, and this is always nice, the Apostle Paul agrees. So if you turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, he writes, and, and this is really, it's a nail down argument, I think. It says, you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's. There it is. See it? When you believe, you receive. You are marked with the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this important? Why am I raising this as a question and making you work so hard? It's because there's you know, some ideas out, different ideas out there. Um, I sat under a pastor who taught me that there are spirit-filled Christians and those who are not. And that you need to ask God for the extra thing, otherwise you're missing out. Worse, you're not quite the real deal and the remedy when pastors like this talk they will encourage people to um, to partake in full immersion now, don't hear me wrong I, I love full immersion but they'll talk about it as a means of uh, the spirit coming and maybe that'll be manifested in the extra thing of speaking in what we've called strange tongues and I want to say to you uh, I take issue with that when people claim that coming to Christ isn't enough, that Christ's work is somehow inadequate, that you need more. Uh, it implies that there are first-class Christians and second-rate Christians. And it falsely demarcates those who've had a deeper experience from those who apparently have not. And I just think it's unhelpful. And I don't think it's what the Bible teaches. So there it is. It's not what Paul teaches. It's not what we see at the end of Acts. On the other hand, I'm talking to, uh, I guess, I assume most people watching this are Anglicans. And uh, I want to say we need to be better and more open about talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. More awareness of the Spirit's indwelling. We need to be better about t talking about this experience. And we now have more confidence to see him at work uh, and more confidence in him to do his work. Uh, the spirit cannot be a stranger. That's not how it is. It's impossible. Um, anyway, then the next question might be, how might we better experience the fullness of the spirit? And I want to say to you, it might, the answer is not what you might think. Uh, Ephesians 5.18 is helpful. Uh, it's worth looking at, at, at where the Apostle Paul talks about the fullness of the Spirit being experienced through ordinary things. And you're like, what? what? Ordinary things? Yeah. Ephesians 5.18, he talks about believers to go on continually being filled with the Spirit by speaking, singing. Oh, you, you do that. Uh, giving thanks, submitting, serving, doing all these things all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is how we experience the fullness of, spirit, of, of the Spirit. It's to do these things in the name of Jesus. So we needn't be afraid of this language. And maybe some of us are going, oh, I'm already doing that. You just need to join the dots. And so I hope you're encouraged. But again, see, it's all in the name of Jesus, which means it's all about our witness to Him as we do it in His name, as we make His name exalted, where we don't make a name for ourselves. Babel.
but we declare the wonders of God by faith in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, God has equipped us with resources to get on with life. And uh, what greater resource than the presence of God himself living in our hearts by faith in Christ uh, via the Spirit. And what a great that help that is uh, to know as we come uh, to a time of prayer. So I commend that to you. Make sure uh, that you do pray. There'll be the blue screen with some prayer points for you as an encouragement and a help. Uh, make sure you pray, please. Uh, remember, if you want to express your love for God uh, by not only the giving from your lips and expressing praise, but you want to praise God with your pockets, uh, there's information at the end of this video to help you do that, uh, if you would like. Um, if you would like. Uh, but for now, we're going to finish with a time of prayer, praise rather, and then I'll close with words of a blessing.
Uh, let me close with the words of the blessing uh, from Ephesians chapter 3. I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth gets its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen.